Hello, everyone. My name is Ryan Kennedy. Thank you for having me at this conference. Um, the title of my presentation is The Privacy Calculus from Within, an Internal Calculus for Privacy Concerns of Mobile Users. It's co-authored by myself, Atfei Mashatan, and Oscar Turgekin. And we are all three from Ted Rogers School of Management at Ryerson University in Toronto, Ontario, Canada. Just to give a little bit of a background about what this paper and project is about, it's generally about understanding the privacy concerns of mobile device users, specifically smartphones and location privacy concerns. So to begin, privacy as a concept has existed and evolved for decades. The continual diffusion of mobile devices with their increasing collection capabilities along with the growing number of data, data breaches over the past few years has changed the privacy landscape and increased privacy awareness and concerns for individuals. Perhaps the most prevalent development affecting individual privacy and privacy concerns is the use of smartphones with their ever increasing capabilities to collect, disseminate and act on personal data. Smartphones are very attractive targets for privacy violations. For example, they are used by individuals widely across the world with 3.2 billion globally, um, and many of which who don't have adequate privacy awareness. They follow individuals everywhere and can maintain un uninterrupted and ubiquitous connections, and they're privy to very personal information, such as tracking your location down to the step. On the flip side, with organization's perspective, the collection of information uh, or the information collected is leveraged for operational effectiveness and competitiveness. For example, a marketing firm may use location-based information to provide targeted advertisements for personalized services. Other organizations may just sell that information so other organizations can use it. And even modern uses, for example, the location tracking for COVID-19 can be used for beneficial pur purposes. However, individuals may not be so willing to provide that information, especially with their heightened privacy concerns and awareness. This creates a tension between the organizations collecting information and the customers providing it, whereby the, the customers want the enhanced services, the organizations want to provide it, but the customers don't want to provide that information. To address these competing interests, technologists, organizations, and policymakers all need to understand privacy perceptions, specifically the privacy concerns of modern smartphone users. Within the privacy literature, there is theories and research examining this phenomenon. For example, one of the most, one of the most predominant theories is the privacy paradox. The privacy paradox says that individuals generally express a high concern for their privacy, yet when you look at their actual behaviors, they're disclosing much more than they had intended. It's the classical, I believe I'm really private. I want to, I value my privacy, but my actions are not consistent with that. Therefore, it's paradoxical. Another theory called the privacy calculus has been used to explain this behavior. And the privacy calculus proposes that a user takes a calculated risk where they look at the pros and cons or the costs and risks <clears throat> versus the benefits uh, of information disclosure in order to make that decision. So the answer to the privacy paradox, according to the privacy calculus, would be that the benefits are outweighing the risks. Therefore, I intend to disclose. Now the privacy calculus has become a dominant paradigm within the privacy literature to understand privacy concerns. It's been used uh, for social networks. It's been used in the context of location-based services, healthcare, mobile applications, and more. Other research hasn't just applied it in new contexts, they've actually extended it. For example, adding new variables on either the cost side or either the risk side, and that would be expanding it outwards, as would combining new theories with the existing privacy calculus. For example, combining a calculus with a technology adoption theory to understand how privacy concerns influence that adoption decision. However, less attention in the modern era has been given to conceptualizing the core variables in the model, specifically privacy concerns on that risk side. That is specifically, there's been little research examining the possibility of an internal calculus of competing beliefs within the existing calculus on their core variables. The current paper addresses this need to understand smartphone users' privacy concerns and privacy perceptions in the modern privacy landscape. We do so by developing a robust extension of the existing privacy calculus. However, 
Unlike prior research, we expand the calculus inward by focusing on one of the variables, the core, one of the core variables, privacy concerns, and looking at the cost benefit of competing beliefs on that variable within the calculus. Our novel internal privacy calculus complements the traditional notice, no, notions of risks and benefits by adding perceptions of protections and influences, both internal and external. That would be adding four new variable categories to the existing calculus. The new internal privacy calculus is more comprehensive than one currently exists in the privacy literature. It connects the fragmented models of extensions within the literature it has more relevant factors for the 21st century privacy, concern, privacy concerns, and it provides a modern view of the privacy calculus that individuals apply for new sophisticated devices and mobile technology. So how was this de model developed? Well, as I mentioned, the original calculus has costs and benefits. However, we took the perspective that additional influences and protections are weighed by individuals in the calculus for privacy concerns. We have a total of 14 hypotheses and six different logical categories, which are as followed below. The original disclosure benefits and risks, and then the added internal protection, external protection, internal influence, and external influence. All the hypotheses are here. I would like to explain the hypotheses by taking a look at the proposed model. So as we can see on the top left in the benefit category, which is all the, B, the, the positive aspects of disclosing your location or giving your information to your smartphone, we have locatability and hedonic motivation, both which are hypothesized to positively influence perceived disclosure value, which in turn is hypothesized to negatively influence location privacy concerns. The more beneficial disclosing your information, the less you might be concerned about your privacy. Risks on the right upper right-hand corner. We have concern of unauthorized secondary use and concern of improper access being positively hypothesized to have a positive relationship with concern of collection. And we have concern of collection and perceived location privacy risk hypothesized to positively influence location privacy concerns. The higher the perceived, <clears throat> the higher the perceived risk of information disclosure, the more you're concerned about your privacy. Working our way down into the middle, on the middle left, we have external influence with social influence within it. This would be influences that are external to the individual, such as your friends, your family, and your network. And we hypothesize that social influence will have a, a positive effect on location, sorry, will have a negative effect on location privacy concerns. In terms of internal influence, we have previous privacy experience which is something that is internalized to the individual. They're my previous privacy experiences. And we have believed that if you've had a recent negative privacy experience, you're gonna have heightened privacy concerns. Going along the bottom, we have external protection on the left and internal protection on the right. External protection would be something that would make an individual feel more comfortable with disclosing their information. And within this category, we have perceived government protection, perceived service provider trust, and perceived brand trust. All three are hypothesized to reduce your location privacy concerns. On the right hand, for internal protection, it's all about how well you believe yourself to be able to protect your privacy. And so we have privacy self-efficacy, which is hypothesized to increase your sense of perceived control, and your sense of perceived control will reduce your privacy concerns. In terms of our method and results, we have two parts to it. Um, the first is part one, which has the, the use of a qualitative survey to collect data. My, my, my apologies, a quantitative survey to collect data and structured equation modeling, specifically smart PLS SEM is used for analysis. Within part two, we have qualitative responses to, open end, to an open-ended question and Navivo 12 and a content analysis are used for that. One survey instrument was used to collect data for both sides of the analysis. There were, uh, we, we surveyed a large Canadian university and with, we had three parts of the survey. Part one is general demographic information as well as questions used to filter out people who would be improper for the sample. For example, if they don't know how to use the location on their phone. Part two was the Likert scales, 49 of them specifically to capture all of the variables just discussed. Part three was the qualitative open-ended question, and it went 
as follows. What is it about your smartphone that makes you feel that your data is or is not being kept private? We gave respondents the opportunity to say why they feel safe in terms of privacy and why they do not both. The collection period was 29 days. The average time was 24 minutes. Total responses was 603. They were students in terms of our participants, which is a good sample for this study because students use smartphones more than any other age group. They grew up in an era where smartphones were no longer an emerging technology, but were taken for granted, which shows that their behavior now is different than older generations, which is important because in the older generations is when the original privacy calculus was made and ours is updated to reflect the modern. And the students will be more like future generations than past generations, which makes the implications of this research uh, more longer lasting and more relevant. We had 559 good responses for the quantitative analysis and 583 for the qualitative analysis. In terms of gender distribution, there were slightly less males than females. In terms of age, 18 was the youngest and uh, 56 was the oldest, giving us 38 years of, uh, of the span for age. In terms of education, 91.6% were completing their undergraduate degree, which makes sense because this was our sample. And in terms of location, we had 43 different Canadian cities. We also had a variety of smartphones types with uh, Apple being used the most, and we had over 14 different service providers. In terms of analysis, as mentioned, PLS SEM was used to analyze the quantitative results. We followed the standard guidelines by Hare et al, uh, at, which means that we went with the measurement model followed by the structural model. We also tested for common method bias, which would be the variance that's uh, attributed to the actual model itself and not what you're trying to measure. And so uh, there was no considerable common method bias for our research. In terms of the measurement model, which is looking at our reliability and validity, we, um, in terms of reliability, looked at the composite reliability as well as Cronbach alpha. In terms of convergent and discriminant validity, we looked at the HTMT ratio as well as the average variance extracted. We also checked the factor loadings, the model fit using the SRMR measure, and the relevance of prognosis or Q squared. And all of our uh, variables met or passed or were underneath, and depending on the measure, um, they were all acceptable. In terms of our structural model, we use this to assess our hypotheses and we look at the path coefficients, the p-values, the t-values, the effect size or f-squared, and our r-squared values. Again, I'm going to talk to the model in terms of this is our actual hypothesis table and the results, and this would be our model here. And so working again from left to right, top to bottom, we have uh, our benefits. And in terms of locatability and hedonic motivation, they both did increase your perceived disclosure value. So those two hypotheses were found to be significant and perceived disclosure value was found to reduce your location privacy concerns, which was also a significant relationship. On our top right, we have our risks, uh, concerned of unauthorized secondary use, as well as concern of improper access. Both had significant positive relationships with concern of collection and concern of collection and perceived location privacy risk both had uh, significant positive relationships to location privacy concerns. In terms of our external and internal influence, an interesting phenomenon was found that internal influence, meaning things that are internal to you versus external influence, the internal influence had a significant negative relationship, or sorry, a significant positive in this case, and social influence, which was an external influence, did not. A similar case was found with internal and external protection. In terms of internal protection, privacy self-efficacy had a significant relationship with your perceived control, which had a significant relationship with your location privacy concerns. However, in terms of our external protection, none of the three variables had a significant relationship. And so I'll speak to this a bit later, but it shows that things that are internal to people versus external are, have a significant influence on your privacy concerns, which speaks to a level of control as well as on the external side, a level of distrust and lack of transparency. In terms of our structural model, we had some good F squares or effect size. We had a privacy self-efficacy on privacy control was large. Concern of collection on location privacy concerns was medium. And the remain errors was small or lower than that. In terms of our R squared, we also had some good percentages of the total variance explained. 
On our core variable of location privacy concerns, we had just under 34%. In terms of concern of collection, perceived control, and perceived disclosure value, we had 21, 27.1, 34.8, and 26.1% respectively. In terms of our second half of the analysis or our method, we had the contents analysis used to analyze the open-ended questions, which involved open coding categorization and abstraction. Several rounds of reading the, the material line by line, sorting it into categories, reviewing the sorting of that categories, and finally separating the polarity from positive and negative. In terms of our results, we have 12 factors and 22 sub-factors discovered. Um, for the majority of all of these categories, they were negative. People focused a lot more on the negative aspects of what them, makes them feel insecure rather than secure. The first and most important, you can see the count at the end of each uh, statement uh, number. The first was secondary use of data or sharing or selling data. So people were really concerned about having targeted advertisements and general use. They took this as definitely my privacy is not being maintained if I'm getting an advertisement for something I just searched up or spoke about. That was another big theme that people would speak about it without actually um, typing it in and that would be an indication of the lack of privacy. The second was concern of collection. Just generally having your data collected. They don't trust the collectors, so having it collected would mean that it's going to be abused and that could be your phone or your application. Applications on the phone were another big source of lack of uh, security or feeling private uh, with social media, the security features of the applications are not robust and thorough enough. Cloud-connected applications were not trusted. And application permission requests, asking for things they shouldn't be, indicates that they're going to be misusing your data. Fourth was factors on the phone with 112 uh, nodes or, or records of something mentioning this. And it was the operating system having iOS being uh, found to be more secure in, their, in the respondent's opinion than uh, other operating systems. The control of phone settings was one of, one of the positive ones where I can exert my control and therefore feel secure, but there was much more people saying there's a lack of control on the phone settings. And then there were some general phone settings, for example, your location uh, as a setting itself, is, it, it makes people feel insecure. Number five was uncertainty with 102, and that was about collection use and protection. Number six was hackers and data leaking. So being hacked or having your data leaked from a hack, uh, as well as spam calls. The news and media, so hearing something, for example, the Cambridge Analytica um, story was mentioned over and over by recipients or by the respondents. Brand and provider trust, so there was trust and distrust. Um, again, just like with the operating system, Apple was trusted more. Um, however, some people did not trust Apple. The terms condition and privacy policy, which is something that's meant to make you feel secure and, and, and be an agreement between you, you and the organization, um, was actually quite negative, where people take the complexity of these uh, policies and say they're trying to mislead me, uh, I don't feel secure. Laws, regulations, and governments, similar, they're meant to protect you um, in terms of your privacy, but most people don't trust the government and uh, don't believe that their regulations do much, and if they do, that there are workarounds around it. Number 11 was no choice or forced use, and number 12 was your previous privacy experiences. This paper has several theoretical implications as well as practical implications. In terms of theoretical implications, the model itself is, is the largest. So the internal calculus model for smartphone privacy concerns produced, which expands the literature on the privacy calculus, as well as privacy in general. The model is reflective of the modern privacy landscape. Then there's four new variable categories, uh, reflecting a more granular understanding of privacy concerns. Factors internal to the individual, whereas factors, uh, as opposed to factors external to the individual, had a significant effect versus didn't, which shows this really speaks to the importance of privacy control for the individual, as well as theoretical justification for the inclusion of new variables. And it was mixed method research. In terms of practical implications, organizations collecting personal information, smartphone developers and service providers, and government regulators can all benefit by using the results from this paper. 
For example, the organizations collecting personal information now have a deeper understanding of smartphone users' privacy concerns, which they can use to formulate novel data collection strategies to strike a balance between the need to collect and the user's need to protect. Smartphone developers and service providers now have a much more granular comprehension of how their data collection methods and surrounding processes negatively influence privacy perceptions, and they can take action based on that information to try to remedy the solution. Government regulators can realize that they are not trusted and they can develop alternative strategic approaches to protect privacy and alleviate the privacy concerns, knowing that simply having regulations in place does not do it enough. Overall, all four organization types need to give the users more control over their own personal data, but not just that, ensure that they understand how to exercise that control, as well as do take uh, effort to rebuild the trust and transparency into the collection process. I want to thank everyone for their time. I hope this was informative and you learned something new. And uh, I have the references available here. Please contact me or any of my co-authors for more information regarding the project. Thank you.